Thank you for coming um, this morning, and it's it's a great pleasure to be here. And thanks to Carl and BMG for giving us this opportunity to tell you about uh, the the technologies we've de developed at Montana Molecular, and um, we're really here to tell you about how you can make kinetic measurements in the living cell of GPCR signaling pathways. So, um, with that, I'll start by telling you just uh, an overview of the assays that we've developed. Now these are all uh, fluorescent protein based assays and we, um, we can combine these different assays in the same cells to make simultaneous measurements of the different signaling pathways. And so, for example, um, the GPCR analytes and second messengers, including cyclic AMP, diacylglycerol, PIP2, calcium, arrestin, and um, in fact, for our first time at this meeting was in 2013, and we were finalists for innovation of the year for multiplex diacylglycerol calcium assay. So these uh, fluorescent protein assays come in different colors, so red and green, so that is what allows you to do the dual channel measurements. And this is why we really appreciate using the BMG plate reader because the optical paths for um, detecting the fluorescence are really nice paths to be able to measure these kinds of assays. And um, in the realm of phosphodiesterases, for example, you can combine a cyclic AMP assay in green with a cyclic GMP assay in red to be able to um, determine the selectivity of your phosphodiesterase. And the other area that we've just recently kind of expanded into is the safety talks. And these are assays for cell stress that are reversible. And um, we, we won't talk to it at all about those today, but um, my colleague Kevin Harlan will be giving a talk tomorrow um, at 10 o'clock in room 145 if you're interested in cell, cell toxicity. So I just want to just briefly talk about uh, the idea of biostagonism because um, we're really going to talk in the second part of the talk a lot about this new uh, sensor for arrestin that we've developed. And um, just because I know you're aware, um, just to review, the idea is that the signal specificity can lead to an improved therapeutic because if you're able to select for agonists that preferentially activate, say, G protein over arrestin, then you can, um, the idea is that you can then develop drugs that are um, therapeutic and avoid adverse effects. So um, that's kind of the, the, the overall idea of agonist bias. And the really difficult thing up until now has been how do you quantify this? And the, um, the problem has been that in order to quantify it, you need to measure both pathways. And um, the best way to do that is going to be to measure pathways both pathways in the same population of cells because in order to determine the bias, you're going to make comparisons of the results of those assays. So um, another key aspect is that you want to use the same assay modality. You don't want to be using an, an endpoint assay for one pathway and say a kinetic assay for the other pathway because it really makes it difficult to compare those results. So. Um, this talk is about what, how you can make those kind of uh, measurements and quantify them, and how you can do, use your BMG plate reader to do that. Um, one, of the, one of the really powerful ways to be able to quantify bias agonism is by comparing the kinetics of those different responses. And um, that's where 
we've really been doing quite a bit of effort lately is being able to look at these and turn it into a like a bias um, a bias measurement so how can you how can you rate your compounds based on bias and the key thing about looking at the kinetics of this is that you really have to have high quality data because that's what allows you to discriminate from the different compounds because they're all going to be pretty close together in responses so you really want really high signal to noise and high quality data to be able to do that and we'll show you some of that and um, that we collected on the BMG so um, Consider that there are uh, tools then, fluorescent biosensors then, that allow you to look at both GS and GI, so cyclic AMP production and inhibition of cyclic AMP production, and that um, each of these different uh, fluorescent proteins can be combined with one another because they're available in green fluorescent and red fluorescents. And that in the GQ side, um, you can use diacylglycerol, PIP2, or calcium, and combine any of those with the beta arrestin. And that these are all, um, these can all be used to both report and then quantify bias. So um, if you're not familiar with the, the fluorescent protein biosensor type assays, they are really brightly fluorescent. So they can allow you to quantify the um, changes in the cells over time and that they can be either increasing or decreasing in intensity. And so that's very different from a dye. But what it means is that each assay is then reversible. And um, then they can be combined for, to make these simultaneous measurements. And that's just a little picture of, kind of the design of the Arrestin sensor. So you've got Arrestin with its two, um, two sides, two, and then inside the hinge region we insert the fluorescent protein and then optimize the linkers to produce the, the highest signal to noise. So how do you get these into the cell? They're fluorescent proteins, so delivery is a really important thing. And we don't want to limit you to using a particular cell type because there are a lot of, our, of the people that use these sensors, they want to make these measurements, say, in a pancreatic islet cell, something that's relevant to diabetes. Or they want to make the measurement in a neuron or a cardiomyocyte or um, um, a human airway smooth muscle cell. So we want to um, give people those options to look in cells that are relevant to disease. So we use a backman vector delivery system. And the really, the power of that is that you can then optimize the assay by titrating the level of the vector in the cell so that you can dial in for your specific cell type um, where you reach a maximum uh, signal as well as a, um, on a plate reader, a, a maximum Z prime value. So it really gives you a lot of control over the, over the response. And the protocol for using that is straightforward. So you prepare your cells and you can either plate them right away if they're adherent cells, plate them into your dish, or you can um, make a suspension mix with the vector and the cells and the media and then plate that together. So it kind of depends on your cell type, but it's, it's an easy protocol. And then the next day, um, you know, you give 24 hours to allow the fluorescent protein to get made within the cellular machinery. And you, um, the next day you can optionally replace your media with um, PBS because you know, if you have a high, highly fluorescent media, you might want to take that out and put in some uh, buffer. And then you just let that rest for a few minutes, and then um, it goes right into your 
um, Clario Star or your Ferris Star, and um, you can use whatever liquid handling you have to activate the, um, the response with your uh, compounds. Um, but because it's, this is a fluorescent protein-based sensor, we can also uh, make stable lines that just carry that sensor. And this is just a, a um, example of the caddis assay for cyclic AMP. You can see if the lights were down a little, we won't do it, but you could see a much better change on the cell side, just to show you that these are live cells. And um, the drug addition produces this um, immediate large change in fluorescence. And here, this is just the um, uh, beta adrenergic receptor being stimulated with isoproterenol. And this is an example of a decreasing sensor, so it's decreasing in fluorescence, and even though the cyclic AMP is increasing. But what's nice about that is you have the feedback that you have immediately bright cells, so you're confident that your assay's in your cells and ready to activate. So um, a little, I guess it was around June of last year, we published in SLAS Discovery um, a, uh, a paper that describes using the CADIS assay for cyclic AMP, also for detecting GI-mediated responses. And um, on the, on the um, I guess left side there, it's what I'm showing you is the dose curves for um, Quimperol there to show you how clean this data is. I mean, these, each dose is just one single well that's measured over the time period. So it's so easy to get these dose curves because you're just getting the entire curve in a single well. And, um, and it's just, you know, there's error bars. I don't know if you can see them well from in the back there, but those are error bars on each um, time point. And it's just very, um, very good data in terms of signal to noise there. So you, in a, when you're looking at kinetic assays, it's really important to look at how, um, how clean that data is because you're going to use that to discriminate between your agonists when you go to detect agonist bias. Um, and then just that kind of data then produces a very consistent um, dose response curves. And I'm showing that on the right side there. And you can, you can see that the maximum fluorescence on those different curves varies. So that's some clue that you may be um, you may be looking at um, an agonist that's uh, biased toward, um, that has some bias towards arrest in there. So um, I just wanted to show that here that um, getting back to the idea that you can make these measurements in any cell type, our customers have published in many different types of cells now and um, looking at many different uh, disease pathways. And um, these are all on our website, and we're adding to that list all the time. I think two new publications came out this week, in, um, one in neurons, one in, I think, just standard cell lines. But uh, we, try to, we try to keep, keep up with what that, um, what, what's going on in the literature with these assays. And, I think with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Kevin, and he'll tell, he'll show, start showing you some data that we collected on the Clario Star with the um, Arrestin sensor and the G protein um, assays too. And this is Kevin Horley, my colleague. All right, so thanks, Anne Marie, for getting us uh, a little introduction about the technology. Um, and so before I go into uh, the data uh, and all of those things like that, I just want to briefly kind of bring it back to the idea of really detecting um, a biased ligand or biased agonism. 
And as Anne-Marie said, to do this, what we really need is a simultaneous readout of both beta arrestin as well as G protein activation in the same cell. And so Anne-Marie talked about our uh, biosensors that we've developed for the G protein side. I want to briefly talk about our arrestin biosensor as well as set up the case study that we used um, as sort of a nice control to develop our assay for agonist bias. Uh, so as Anne-Marie said, what we did was fuse this bright fluorescent amnion green protein with beta arrestin um, and created a downward based biosensor. So like Anne-Marie talked about with the CADIS or the cyclic AMP assay, it increases in fluorescence upon activation. We next wanted to set up a, a nice case study uh, for analyzing agonist bias. And to do this, we use this really well-characterized GPCR, the angiotensin receptor. And the angiotensin receptor is a GQ-coupled receptor, so it activates either diazoglycerol or calcium signaling, uh, as well as beta arrestin signaling. And the endogenous ligand, angiotensin II, is actually um, sort of a balanced agonist. So it has pretty strong activation for both the GQ and arrestin pathways, uh, with a bit of uh, activity leaning towards the G protein side. But what's really nice is there's a lot of synthetic ligands for the angiotensin receptor, and one of those, S2, is highly arrestin biased. Uh, so this gives us a really nice um, sort of positive and negative control for biased agonism and arrest and activation. And then lastly, to really uh, test our assay, there's a number of different compounds that were created by Trevena that are intermediates between angiotensin II and S2. And so this will allow us to detect multiple different levels of bias. So what I'm showing you here is, uh, and I should mention, all this data was gathered on the Clario star. Um, and what I'm showing you here is just simply uh, our cells transduced with the arrestin sensor, and then um, we activate with either angiotensin II or uh, negative control. And what you can see is we have a really nice uh, response to uh, activation through the arrestin pathway by angiotensin II, uh, no response with the vehicle. And so this was really nice uh, sort of optimization of the arrestin sensor. And then what we did is go through and treat cells with uh, concentrations of either angiotensin II, S2, or this whole group uh, of different Trevena peptides. Um, and there's a couple of things that I hope you can appreciate from this. And first, it's that the kinetic readout is actually going to be really important uh, for being able to reliably quantify these differences in arrest and activation. And that's because a lot of assays, uh, especially for arrest and are endpoint assays, where you would add the drug here, wait, and look at your samples around 20 minutes later. But by 20 minutes, you're already experiencing a pretty high level of data compression. So the differences that you see early on um, in these kinetic responses are compressed by around 20 minutes. So the, actually the ability to monitor the kinetic response to these activities is going to be really important for determining our bias uh, ratio. Um, and I just want to say that the data I showed you previously was with uh, maximal doses stimulating concentrations. We can also go in and calculate nice dose response curves uh, for either, in this case, angiotensin II or one of the other intermediate Trevena compounds. And so what we did from here is simultaneously add our red calcium sensor along with our green beta arrestin sensor into the same cells and then stimulate with all of these different compounds, um, taking simultaneous measurements of both the calcium activity as well as the beta arrestin activity. And now I'm going to blow this calcium data up in a minute so you can see it uh, a little bit better, but I think what's really nice um, about this is it shows um, that you can collect both longer term as well as shorter term kinetics uh, simultaneously in the same experiment uh, using the Clario star, which is really advantageous when you're looking um, at things that are occurring over much different time scales, such as the calcium signaling or the arrestin signaling. 
And so what we can see here is we can compare both the calcium response as well as the arrestin response for each of these different compounds. Um, and so for example, angiotensin II, um, as well as this Trevena 55 compound are sort of our balanced agonists. So they have pretty strong activation of both the arrestin pathway as well as the calcium pathway. And then we get into sort of these intermediate compounds like Trevena 45 that has a pretty decent arrestin response, but a pretty limited calcium response. And so what we need now is a way to sort of quantify this bias. And to do that, we turn to Samuel Hoare from Pharmacanics um, to really help us figure out what's the best way to take advantage of this kinetic data to calculate a really simple bias ratio. Um, and I'm not qualified to talk about any of the mathematics or things like that that Sam used to develop these assays, um, but he has a poster today um, that can go into much more detail. But the long and the short of it is we were, Sam was able to figure out um, a way to put a value to the rate of activation for arrestin. Um, and in this case, we've just inverted the data uh, here so it looks like it's going upward. And a rate of activation for the calcium data. And then you can simply compare the K tau for arrestin, the K tau for calcium, and calculate a bias ratio. And so from this, we were able to sort of nicely recapitulate um, all of the bias that has come from these compounds. So as I said, angiotensin is sort of a balanced agonist. S2 is going to be uh, your most biased uh, or a restin biased agonist. And then we can have a really nice rank order of these other compounds in terms of their uh, bias activity. Um, and this is really great because this is something you could take down to your chemist in the pharmacology department and say, here's my list of bias. I'd like to improve and be more G protein bias, more arrestin, or have more activity towards one or the other. Uh, so with that, um, I'll turn it over to Carl here. Um, but if you have any questions for us about any of this, uh, we're at booth 1548. Um, and like I said, if you're interested in looking at how we quantify this bias, uh, Sam's poster is today. Um, and I will be talking about um, another half of our company and some more experiments we actually did on the Clario Star uh, cell stress type of experiments uh, tomorrow morning. So thank you guys very much. Okay, thanks Kevin and uh, Anne-Marie, that was really, uh, really great stuff. Um, so my job is now to um, kind of take, take you forward in time. So what are the next steps um, and what are the no new capabilities that you're going to be able to see um, that BMG is allowing you to, to have with new instrumentation? And um, so I'm going to talk about um, the Clariostar Plus. Um, so all of the data that, um, that Kevin showed was, was gathered on the first iteration of the Clariostar. Outstanding piece of instrumentation uh, based on, uh, that uses linear variable filters for uh, fluorescence detection. Um, but we've now uh, made some improvements that, will, that we think will really be helpful uh, going forward. So um, as I said, uh, so the, the Clariostar is a multi-mode reader. Um, we've really only looked at the fluorescence aspect of it today, but um, uh, for labs that are um, you know, doing these types of approaches, having multiple different detection modalities is, is really important. Um, but as I said, so, so, but we will be focusing on the, the fluorescence intensity aspects of it today. Um, and so the key feature uh, of, the, of the Clario Star was the patented linear variable filter monochromator. Um, so it literally is um, glass slides that allow you to select the, um, uh, the rising and falling edge of the wavelengths that you're allowing through. And so it, it has very good um, uh, trans light transmission, so pr provides filter light performance while keeping the ability to have uh, the selectability to be able to do, say, the two different wavelengths for the red and green uh, 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 proteins uh, uh, that, that, that were the sensors for Montana Molecular. Um, and for development purposes, you can do uh, excitation emission scans so that you can really, uh, really focus in on the wavelengths that are appropriate for your particular assay. 
Um, and then it can also be used for, fil for filter-based, so for highest sensitivity, especially in, say, cell-based assays. Um, that's very important. And then there are read modes that re absolutely require uh, filters. Uh, and the last technology shown here is uh, the UV-Vis uh, absor absorbance spectrometer. So it literally can do um, all of the, all of the, the assays that you, that you need to, to be productive in your day-to-day -day life in lab. Um, one of the features that, uh, that it has is something it shares with uh, our Ferristar as well is the ability to do uh, Z height adjustment and so that can be done from either the top or bottom. Bottom reading is potentially very important if you're doing cell based assays. Uh, so this is, it will give you the, the best chance of seeing what's actually happening in your cells and um, if you have a uh, non-confluent uh, scenario within the cell, you, you actually have the ability to look at the non-homogeneous uh, aspects uh, by either some averaging or uh, an actual well scan. So um, there's a, uh, different matrices, different sizes, different resolutions that you can use uh, to make sure that you're seeing everything that you need to see that's happening in your cells. So um, the advances in uh, the, the Clarion Plus are the fact that you, we now have um, enhanced dynamic range uh, and this is going to uh, eliminate the, the need for performing um, manually or you know, uh, I, I, it's going to take out a step in the reading process. You don't have to have a pre-setting uh, of the gain. This will allow you to look at uh, multiple different gains for every well and um, that will increase the, the detection range um, up to eight decades in one reading. Uh, so, I mean, you can really look at low and high uh, signals in the same well. Um, and as, as I said, there's, uh, you're, you won't be working ahead of time trying to optimize the settings. You can literally put the plate in and start reading. Um, and it, it does this by, and maintains the industry-leading sensitivity specifications that were, uh, were available in the, in the original uh, Clario Star. Another aspect that is um, uh, important for people that are very serious about um, doing these types of multiplexed assays um, is that we improved it with a f uh, the ability to have a far red fluorescence detection, um, and so this will allow you to read um, FI up to uh, 900 uh, nanometers. Uh, so if you have you know a more far red shifted uh, scenario. Um, and the, uh, we'll, so this will basically allow you to better separate the two different signals that you're looking at and really opens up the doors to, uh, to allowing you to use, the, use any type of uh, fluorescent uh, tool that, that is out there. Um, if you are um, and, and, and in that same scenario where you can actually have a second uh, PMT that is dedicated for luminescence and uh, alpha screen detection, so really just providing you with the absolute best tools for each, each individual assay that are, that, that are available. So um, how does it help? Uh, so uh, this is uh, showing how the, the dynamic range, and uh, you can't really see the scale here, but it's going from uh, nearly 100 million uh, counts down to about 20,000 counts in, in one individual read. And uh, so that's a, you know, set, and these are replicates of individual wells that were read, that, that were read that I read using uh, size 7.5. So this shows both the enhanced dynamic range and also uh, you know, the ability to detect these really far red shifted um, fluorophores. Um, this is also useful for um, kinetic type assays. So uh, you know, when you're setting the gain for a kinetic assay, you might make a mistake and not know how quickly your signal is going to rise. Um, with the enhanced dynamic range, um, you're, since you're taking multiple uh, readings at, at, at different gains, you uh, will have a very low chance of seeing overflow values um, and you can really see that the, the signal can just basically keep continuing to go up for these enzymatic assays. Okay, in this one, uh, another depiction. Um, so typically to, to be able to see um, the, the entire range of, of concentrations over such a broad range, you would have to um, use a manual, use several different manual gains, um, and with the enhanced dynamic range, you do not have to worry about those gain settings. Just read the plate, and all of the data uh, for, for across the concentrations comes out. Yes. So, do you think the function only for the experiment time, or do you have any for the 
right now. It's um, it's only going, going to be available on the Claris R Plus. Um, it, it's very possible that it's something that will be uh, added going forward. Um, so, but yes, right now, just for the Claris R Plus. Okay, um, and another. Uh, another capability that I want to, to talk, talk a little bit about is um, the, the atmospheric control unit. This is something that's been, um, you know, growing in importance for uh, the Clarius R over the last several years, and we've really added some uh, some capabilities that take it from not just uh, you know the ability to have uh, uh, cells that are surviving in the, in the in the reader for long term experiments but really a tool that you can use to manipulate what's going on within within the reader uh, to see what effect that's actually having on the cells so um, I mean it's still going to be something that you are going to be able to use to regulate both oxygen and CO2 uh, so that can be at static levels so that you're maintaining an environment that is that, that is the same environment that the cells were in in the incubator um, and therefore um, you know they're not they're not being stressed by the long term away from the, the, the appropriate oxygen levels uh, and CO2 levels. But as I said, it, you can now also do variations and um, uh, you know, actually drop the percentages down to, to 0.1%. And so this is very important for um, you know, people that are studying hypoxia especially. Um, but the, the uh, the newest functions that we've uh, we've been working on is, are, are the gas ramping functions, and this is what I was talking about in terms of using this more as a tool to to actually um, see what how your cells actually respond. And so, what's shown here is um, the uh, the regulated uh, CO2 at a at a constant level, but a scenario where um, you actually um, have an, a nitrogen input to force the oxygen out of the system. Um, and then maintain that level, low level of, uh, of, of oxygen in the system for a period of time, and then um, vent the nitrogen so that the oxygen will now return into the system. So these types of um, oxygenation uh, regulations that uh, are going to be very useful for, uh, especially th things like ischemia reperfusion studies, um, but also, you know, you know tumors are experiencing different oxygen levels under different conditions. So this is a way to really start to mimic that uh, type of environment within a plate reader. And um, we're, we're working to make sure to make this uh, the ability to do these types of gas rampings um, easier and easier. Um, with the Clara Star Plus and uh, the, the recent uh, the, the software release that will come with it, there's now a graphical interface that allows you to um, better visualize how, the, what type of assay you're setting up. So um, how, how long you're going to be at, the, the, at your initial oxygen level, how, how, you know, what level you need to take it down to. And um, this can be done in multiple different steps. So you can have various different stages of, of oxygen levels uh, throughout the, uh, the period of, your, of the experiment. And um, so while you're doing this, then you can also be running up to three different protocols. So um, it really is a way to start multiplexing in this, uh, in this platform so that you're getting the absolute most information out of each individual experiment. So this is, um, uh, so this is the graphical interface that will allow you to, um, once you have created a step-by-step uh, -step protocol uh, for the gas regulation to actually visualize what's going to happen before you start running the experiment. I think that I, I'm, I just, I just think this is a really uh, uh, nice uh, <laughs> way to, to I, I'm, I'm definitely much more of a visual learner of this, and so when I saw this, I was, I was very excited. Um, okay, so uh, the last thing that I want to talk about uh, is the extended wavelength PMT, um, and so not only is that going to be useful for uh, uh, detection of you know, more and more far red shifted uh, 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 fluorophores, but there's, uh, you know, there's, with the traditional um, uh, PMTs, there is a drop off in performance. So you'll even see some, uh, some differences in uh, uh, you know, uh, not, not far, far red uh, uh, fluorophores such as Alexa 647 shown here. Um, and so what we've, what we've seen is there's very good performance over a lot wide concentration range and that uh, the, 
the, when we compare this uh, new extended wavelength PMT with uh, our standard PMT, we have a, a much better LOD performance. And um, with, with filters, you can get down to a sensitivity or LOD of, of 0 0.8 picomolar for Alexa 647. So, um, you know, we really are um, providing just the best possible measurement systems for all, all different uh, types of assays. Okay. So um, with that, I'll thank you, and um, we, will, we would all be happy to take any questions you have. Um, if you want more information from BMG, you can visit us, visit us at booth 811. And I definitely want to thank uh, everybody who worked on the, on the Claire Star Plus. Um, I, it's a, a, a step in, 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 the, in the right direction to really open up the doors for, uh, for the researchers out there. So thank you.